welcome. This is Alistair Nacht. Tonight I've got a very special guest. She is a member of the Society for Art of Imagination. She is also an adept of the Esoteric Order of Dagon. She's an oracle and a painter and a very, very talented artist. Her YouTube channel has been around since 2010, and she has 1.1 million views. So she's been around for a while. She's also located in my hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. My guest tonight is Orly Stewart. Orly, welcome to the program. Good evening. I'm so excited to talk to you today. So how long have you been on the left-hand path? I started getting super curious into Satanism when I was 16 years old. I got a copy of the Satanic Bible and also a copy of the Necronomicon, and I became super obsessed with figuring out an alternative path for my spirituality because I grew up in a pretty religious household, and I had even gone to a religious elementary school growing up, so I didn't even really have science class until I was in middle school and I got into an art school. So it was very religious when I grew up and I could tell that something was wrong in what I was experiencing because I didn't feel like people's actions matched up with the things they were saying they were supposed to be doing and all those hypocrisies in the dogmas of conventional mainstream religion. And I started even becoming uh, a bit of a, uh, rebel in school and I was always getting kicked out of class for asking questions about things that I wasn't supposed to ask and noticing contradictions and stuff in the bible and uh so um that that was even before I was 16 that was when I was like a little kid so I, I think it was always my perception of things and then I started learning more about Satanism when I was 16, and I, I got my hands on the Satanic Bible, and that really changed everything for me. So after you got the Satanic Bible, how did you make the decision to stay on the left-hand path? Was there something that really inspired you? or? Well, I continue to have paranormal experiences through my life. And that's what really drew me to seeking that there was something more because I would tell my parents about seeing the ghosts or the weird, strange stuff that would come to me in the night. And they would tell me, oh, Orly, you're just dreaming, but I had not gone to sleep. And so I would run into their room and be like, mom, dad, like there's something here and they wouldn't care. And so the religion I was given wasn't answering any of those questions. And I was very afraid. I was so afraid of spirits and ghosts and even cemeteries, um, which I love now. But back when I was a little kid, I would freak out if I would go into a cemetery because all these things of the unknown were never explained. And it was just sort of like, you don't ask about that kind of stuff, that kind of dark stuff. And the, the mystery of what is there, what is being hidden from me that keeps like reaching out to me through these experiences was something I could not avoid. So I would definitely say that the reason why I've continued down this path was not a choice that I made. It's just who I am and how I have adapted to surviving in a world where a lot of people are enslaved to things that don't even make sense to them. Um, but uh, then I started watching all kinds of strange videos on the internet. I would be left alone a lot when I was a teenager um, for weeks at a time, my mom would go away uh, out of town. So I would just watch all kinds of weird, uh, obscure documentaries about aliens and demons and all kinds of strange stuff uh, alone. And then the paranormal experiences just kept <laughs> coming and getting more and more. And then um, because I never fit into the person that my family wanted me to be, um, because they're, like I said, they're very religious. So even having tattoos and piercings is completely blasphemous and against my family's religion. Um, so what's important was for me to be that person that they wanted me to be. And I knew that I, I couldn't be that person. I couldn't just blindly 
be the person they were, my family was trying to mold me into to follow their religion. And that made me really want to rebel against that in any way that I could find and learning more about spirituality and these things that were very controversial was very, very appealing to me. So I eventually moved out. Um, when I was 17, I had worked really hard. I got a job and I had a place and uh, I lived in this little rooming house. And this is back when I lived in Canada in uh, downtown Toronto. And I met a guy at a goth party that I was at with a fake ID because uh, I was not old enough to be at the goth club. Uh, I had a fake ID and I met a guy that was part of a occult order called the, uh, the OTO, which is like the outer order for Aleister Crowley's organization. And so I met this guy and he introduced me to the OTO when I was uh, 17, 18. And then I started getting super into learning about magic. And in particular though, black magic was always more appealing to me than everything else because it was always the thing that people would say like, oh, it's that's dangerous, but, but they wouldn't explain why. And um, I've always been very adventurous with my spirituality. And that's what also eventually led me to devote myself to, to Satan ritualistically, which I did when I was about 25 is when I did what I would call a formal ritual of selling my soul to Satan. Now, of course, that is controversial in uh, it, uh, you know many people's eyes of, of what you want to call that, but I, I wanted to do something that would symbolically represent that, where I would be giving every aspect of myself to Satan to see what would happen, because I really wanted to know what would happen if I tried to do this, and I did this whole ritual that I put together, and I used all the knowledge that I had from studying the occult and ceremonial magic and then being part of all these orders for like over a decade at this point and compose this ritual uh, using uh, planetary squares of Saturn and all this other stuff. And I did it on Halloween. It was very symbolic and very profound. And since that time, it totally changed my life. And uh, so if people want to say like, well, something like that isn't real or doesn't work, it's definitely whatever I did worked. And uh, I sit here today due to what Satan has given to me. And that is something that humbles me so extremely deeply. And um, that was the most symbolic time for me when I really had figured out, this is my path. This is what I'm trying to do. And what I'm trying to do is literally like help illuminate the world from the slavery of what we have been given to have the power of spirituality and um, like the praetor natural realms and have access to that in your own life. And that's also a big aspect of the motivation behind my art in general is like uh, to be like a catalyst for those things. Yeah, I think that's, that's something that a lot of people on the left-hand path fall into a trap of of saying, well, this person doesn't say the exact words that I say. They uh, they don't fit my idea of a Satanist or a witch or what have you. And I think they miss out on a lot because I think in a lot of ways, we're all talking about the same thing when it comes to spirituality, but people are very quick to say, oh, you didn't say the right words. And I find that to be right hand path, you know, that, that yeah. prejudice that, well, you know, they don't believe exactly what I believe, you know, Baptist, Pentecostal, Catholic, you know? And so it, it, uh, I think people really miss out on a, a real blessing from that. So can you share with our viewers and our listeners, tell us a little bit about your core beliefs. Initially, I would say that I'm a witch at heart. I like to experience all the different forces that are in this reality, light and dark. And I work with all of those things in my magic. What I think is actually kind of interesting is that so I'm actually 
consecrated as a bishop, like a Catholic bishop. But I did this through Gnosticism. And so I did it so I could get the, the power of that and then apply it into uh, working with satanic magic, demonic magic, um, like Lovecraftian magic by the idea is to, um, to take the current of all the energy that's going around from this world and to essentially uh, usurp it for the powers of the people and then apply it in ways where people who like actually are Catholic or Christian would be like, never, it would never like ever think that that would be okay. So, uh, <laughs> and that, that's also something that you find too, like um, in a lot of other cultures, like in, um, in folk magic, for example, like you have people conjuring uh, like the devil and Jesus and, you know, in Mexico and things like that. And in a lot of different traditions. And of course, like people that are actually Christian would be like, that is the devil, right? So it's not, uh, that's one aspect of it. So that's, um, I guess the best way to explain how I am trying to incorporate all these things. And I think that there is a lot of value to it because um, it also makes it so you're not afraid of what other people are doing. So it's like, okay, whatever, like you can pray for me, but like these things are already on my side. So they're like, good luck with that. So uh, that's that's a big aspect of it. But initially for me, uh, I think it's about meeting the different entities and learning from them as an ambassador without some sort of predisposed judgment or prejudice based on what I've been told. So like, with the demons when I first started evoking them. Uh, I was talking about this last night on one of my live streams on my channel, but the idea was like, I didn't want to look at the book and learn what these spirits were supposed to be like. I wanted to do the work and meet them myself and, and be an ambassador, like an alien intelligence, knowing that these books were written in ways where they're cloaked in religious propaganda from the ruling religions of time and in the past. And another aspect of those grimoires is that um, the reason why they were able to survive and not be destroyed is because people will put like all these prayers to God, like all around all the demon stuff and change it around so it wouldn't get destroyed. And that was a big aspect of it. Um, the Ars Notoria in particular uh, was survived uh, because of that. But um, that being said, I'm an ambassador and it's because that's like the initial experience for me with all these spirits was them trying to contact me and me trying to figure it out. So my core beliefs are uh, I'm open-minded to all the different forces. I try to not um, have any prejudices in my heart when I meet them. And I try to work with a little bit of everything to see how that can actually change reality and also to help people understand like with the demons, um, most of them are not evil, but we just have this perception of that. And it can even be that they are like being pushed into being evil by people who really want it to be that way. And I'm finding a lot like now, like my current like belief process and what I've been learning from the spirits is they don't really want that. Like they, it's more of like a gray area. So I would say like my beliefs are like gray, you know, uh, it's like very much like a, um, I have love in my heart. I try to be like good vibes love type of energy with all the spirits but like also you know fuck around and find out uh just everybody's got their own space to be and something to teach us but just like everyone that is misunderstood so are these spirits and one of the things one of my teachers told me when I first started summoning the demons was that with most of these spirits like barely anyone has contacted them in so long so of course they're going to be angry and have a disposition about them and that's a big aspect of it too um but when, when I first started summoning the demons I didn't know other people other than my teacher who had actually been summoning demons like there were no 
Facebook groups or uh, people like talking about the, those things when I first started uh, putting all this stuff out there. So I always just wanted to have the stuff I'm doing go off into the beyond and then see like what other people are experiencing too to try to figure it all out. So you have a lot of videos about summoning demons. Do you have a favorite that you like to work with? Um, it's, it's really hard for me to, to, to pick a demon because then I feel like the other demons are going to be uh, jealous of that. So what I'll say, what I'll say is um, there's a lot of demons that I really love that I work with a lot. Some of the ones that I work with the most are um, Satan. I also work with Belial quite a bit. And um, the demon Siri from the Goetia has been one of my personal favorites um, to work with, for sure. And then I also do quite a bit of work with Lilith as well. That's a, that's a good one. I love Lilith. So... You are a very talented painter. Um, I, I did not know that uh, before I started doing the research for finding questions to ask you, but uh, uh, how long have you been painting? I started drawing all the time when I was in school, like back when I was in religious school, because I didn't want to pay attention in class. So I would just draw and doodle. And then they would take my pages away. And then I would just draw myself. So that's like when I started um, making stuff out of my imagination. And then I started painting when I was in high school. That's when I first got like access to that kind of materials. And um, that's when I really started trying to learn how to paint more um, back back then. And I initially, like, I, I straight up never thought that I would be writing books about the occult or working as a tarot reader or making videos. I thought that I was going to be some sort of painter. And that was what I always really wanted to do. And that was also what I really focused a lot of my magic spells on when I first got started on things. So I think it's kind of um, beautiful that, like, things have come full circle where I've been able to um, use the, the platform that I've built over the years to now help people share the art because that's what I've always really wanted to do. Um, I started painting and I have a bit of a crazy story. So when I was in high school, I would take the back of like band posters and flip them over so it was just blank. And then I would draw these like disturbing monsters on them uh <laughs> listening like metal music in my room like you know like the <laughs> epitome of the angsty teen and so I, I was doing that and then I had this crazy experience where I saw these spirits like all around me and they were communicating to me how they wanted me to keep doing the art or they were going to come take me away and it was this really really weird experience that I had and um that scared the shit out of me so that was like that was a big aspect of me trying to figure out like what the heck is going on um like with all these experiences and I know I'm not insane I have been um tested by doctors so like you know there's also that aspect of it too um but that's that's when I really started uh that's when I really got motivated to do things and I went to university for painting but then I changed my major to it being the video art major because I felt like if I stayed in school for painting that the school would try to change my style too much. And that's the thing that people always really liked about it. Um, and so that's why I decided to do that. I also saw that you were part of the Lightbringers exhibition. Um, I believe that was in Toronto at yeah. Gallery 1313. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? That was a very significant experience for me in my life because I had been exhibiting my art already for at least a few years in California, but I had never been able to actually go there. And I was also not even old enough to be allowed to be at the events that my art was being exhibited at 
there because I was like a teenager and so they were exhibiting it at like like uh, like opening the, like art at the opening for the punk rock museum and like all these other places in LA and the Hollywood area I was part of an art collective of uh like weird surreal uh kind of anarchistic artwork and so anyway um I was exhibiting with them and I had never been able to actually go to any of my art shows in the flesh and so that exhibit came up and it was right at a big time for me where I had been doing a ton of spells to try to really change my life and push it forward and um so that exhibit it was organized by Jeremy Crow and um so it was run by Satanists and also Thelemites and at the time I had been already like knowing the people that were into Thelema from my work in ceremonial magic. So it was a way of um, integrating ceremonial magic and satanic art all into one art exhibit. And it was a very, very cool art show. I had a lot of really profound inspiration from seeing all this work together because it really is quite special to see a whole lovely fancy gallery full of art that is all like satanic art and very professionally well done and they also had some um presentations I believe so it was a really cool event and uh it was also a big time for me because I was like 21 when that happened or 22 so um that was one of the pivotal moments of my life where it actually felt like wow my magic is actually working and and it's not just like some art show, but it's like a Satan art show. Um, so that was really cool. Do you have a favorite subject that you like to paint or favorite theme? I mean, besides yes. satanic, but. <laughs> um, I definitely think that naked women is my favorite theme to paint for sure. Really? Yeah. I mean, you probably noticed that there's a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I really like, uh, the ethereal form and I think a big aspect of it too sort of is reminiscent of that like the sky cladness of magic where you're like feeling free and then of course um through my life too I always I like had a lot of struggles with anorexia so um learning to like love my body was also a big aspect of like my spiritual process so I think it kind of comes through that as well but um I'm also like pretty queer so there's also that aspect of it too that it's like the paintings were like you know calling me out before I was like publicly about it so yeah <laughs> oh yeah it was really really good and and I love your witch of Evoria am I saying that right it's, Evoria uh, it's a Ev Evora Evora. Yeah. Okay. Can so, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for oh that? Yeah. So that is a whole other thing. So I have been learning a lot about different kinds of spirituality and magic since I've lived in New Orleans. And there is a book about Saint Cyprian, who was this saint that conjured demons. And so part of the legends that are in this book, they talk about this witch uh, called the, the Witch of Evora. And the story is told in a lot of different books about the, the lore of St. Cyprian. And it, it changes a bit here and there. But the basic idea is she was a real person who was a witch and she was doing a spell for some people. And then the authorities came in while she was doing the spell and they had this sight to behold that it went through history of being so bizarre where they she had different rats like holding things and and all this kind of strange stuff that you would never expect to see um in real life and so that legend um uh, and then you know, she was she was executed and so she is like this incredibly powerful witch spirit that uh people work with in, in a lot of different magical traditions and so I had never seen any artwork that depicted that scene at all like and I'm and maybe there is and and someone that's watching that um is from Brazil 
or that speaks Portuguese is aware of some books that I wasn't able to find and like maybe that I would love to know but um, I did try to find things but I could not find any art that depicted this incredible scene from the legend so I was just so like uh, possessed by her um, that I was uh, provoked to make the painting so other people could see what it was and so that that's what the painting is of it's it's of her doing the spell and and what the authorities saw when they when they came into the room and uh yeah it was really cool and the the first time that um my partner and I had conjured her they turned to me in the middle of the night while sleeping looked at me and said she's here and so um (laughs) so yeah uh that was that was something uh for sure yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never yeah. Moment. yeah, that that'll get you going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so so you do custom paintings as well, uh, yeah. which is a really interesting offering. What has been your most surprising request that you've received? Well, most of the custom work that I do for people are devotional pieces to particular demons. So the type of art that I like to do, I call it spirit portals, where the painting serves as an icon for the spirit to come through. So you can put it on your altar or hang it on a wall, or you could even just have it to put general energy somewhere. And that's what I usually do. Or sometimes they'll be like, oh, there's a a succubus spirit that I'm trying to connect with. Can you you channel her and give her her form and, and that I can work with that? So that's that's the usual thing, which is already uh, weird <laughs> for 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 a, a thing to do uh, compared to normal things. Um, but the weirdest thing that I request for painting that I've ever had was from a demon itself to make a painting of him and then to send it to a lady that he was very very fond of. And so um, I did get permission from the lady before I send it to her in the mail. Um, that I needed to do just like for my own sake I I I, I'm just in terms of things like I'm a pretty moral person like when it comes to stuff like I I don't want to like freak out some lady that was trying to get so so the the story behind it this is why it's even weirder um so I had the demon is Siri which is one of my favorite demons and this is one of my first very serious experiences from working with him so I I evoke him and ask him to help me with something and what he wants is for me to paint him and send it to this guy who I was doing the rituals with ex-girlfriend because he missed her and the demon missed her and the demon used to be conjured by her and she got all freaked out by him doing black magic and that was part of why they even broke up so like it was like a whole weird, very, very creepy thing that uh, the demon requested that I do it, and I did, and uh, it was okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was definitely the weirdest thing. Yeah, that that's an unusual request, I mm-hmm. would say. <laughs> you, like me, have had addiction. Uh, I'm an addict. Uh, in fact, my addiction took place right there in New Orleans, uh, Lower Ninth Ward and, you know, French Quarter type stuff. Um, a lot of people on the left-hand path struggle with addiction. Um, can you share a little bit about your experience with that? Yes, absolutely. I, I would love to. And it's something that I haven't talked about very much before but now that I have gotten away from drugs and alcohol for so many years I'm able to have a better perspective on things and I think explain it better to people so it initially started when I was a kid because I was prescribed Adderall for my ADHD and Adderall is essentially prescription meth right and so I started realizing that taking the pills would make me feel good And then I would take more than I was supposed to. And then I would stay up and get a lot of work done. And then from taking those pills that I was prescribed, it led me to want to take other drugs too. And so I got pretty addicted to ketamine when I was in high school. And um, I somehow managed to graduate high school just by 
I don't even know. Uh, I, I did. <laughs> and I somehow graduated on the honor roll, but uh, I would, I would be like doing ketamine in the bathroom and like going to class. And, and I lived in Canada and I would literally be like doing ketamine to stay warm, to take the bus, to like go home. Um, and, and so like, it was really, really bad. And I had a job and like all my money would be just going to buy drugs, like as a teenager. And so that was when my addiction really started. And I also became addicted to alcohol at the same time along with that it was really kind of like whatever I could get my hands on and what was around was what I was doing and um, then I got really into spirituality and I quit alcohol for quite some time and I think a big thing that I wanted to talk about today too just in regards to this is me getting off of drugs and alcohol wasn't just like a one-time thing it took a lot of times of getting off of it. And then I fell back on and then I got off of it again. And then it happened again until I really was just done with going through the suffering and feeling like shit from being drunk and on drugs. Um, that's really what, what did it for me. I got tired of feeling bad and I really just wanted to live my life, um, and be free from all those things. And so it was really easy for me to continue getting back into addiction um, when I moved to America because of all the people I was around. Um, they would they were very much also addicts, and so they would be uh, partying all the time, doing cocaine all the time. Uh, I lived with someone who was a like a club MC, and and he would do parties every week. So like they would have the after party at my house, and so we would just be doing drugs all the time. And these are all people that were into magic too. So um, I think a big aspect of it is realizing how creative people are very easily susceptible to this kind of stuff, and especially people that are interested in spirituality because a big aspect of it is escapism and also feeling like you have more control over things and, and changing how you feel and feeling like you have power. Um, so that's a big aspect of it too, just like as a coping mechanism, but eventually it's just eating you away. And so eventually um, I got to the point where I was really like the, the end of it all for me was, um, when I was really, really hooked on Adderall again. Um, and this was less than 10 years ago. This was like you know, just a couple of years ago. I was really, really addicted to Adderall again. And then I was also living with someone who would have their meth all over the place. And so I was like accidentally drinking things that had meth in it and uh, drinking alcohol all the time just to try to escape reality and thinking that those things were making me get my work done. Um, it got to the point where like literally like now, I, I actually went a couple of months ago and I, I privated a lot of my older videos where I was extremely high on Adderall because um, I don't like the way that I look in that. And, and um, I don't know if other people can tell, but I certainly can. And it's not a good look. And you think at the time, like when you're speeding that like people can't tell, but like they probably can. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I thought that I needed all that stuff to get my work done, but it's just, you gotta just fucking try harder. Like that's pretty much how it is for me. Well, I hate my life, but like that's, that's basically it. It's like, I, I had to just not rely on other things to force me to get stuff done because when you're getting it done, it's not even really that good. And then also on top of it, the spirits kept pushing me out of these situations because they know that like you're killing yourself. Now, of course, there's going to be spirits that feed off of your suffering. And this, I think, is a big aspect of what happens to people, especially Black magicians that get super into drugs and alcohol. And like for me, I had to literally just get away from all of those situations my partner also doesn't drink or do drugs. So it's really easy for me to not engage in those things. But um, that's my best advice to people is like, get away from the situations where it is being around. And that's like, as hard as it is, once you get away from doing that stuff, you probably won't even wanna be around the people that are on it anyway, because you actually see like what's going on. and with the spirits and I know like with Satan a big aspect of it is the spirits want to help you if you're actually help you in a good way 
not the parasitic low level spirits. And I don't mean demons. I mean like low level spirits that feed off of people's suffering. Um, those would love for you to just fall down, get all into drugs and alcohol and like feed off of your suffering from that. Have you keep doing magic thinking you're doing your life to get better, but just keep slumping down. Um, and they feed off of that and they trick you because they might give you like little tokens here and there to show like, oh, something is happening, but you have to look at it from the bigger picture of things. A big aspect of spirituality is freedom from enslavement. So if you are enslaved to things like that, it's you're not using your brain to its full capacity. And of course, there's like ritualistic purposes for all of these things, and they're all sacred in special particular ways. And then I'm not trying to like shit all over that. And that's not what I mean at all by this. I mean, like, if you're just, if you're doing it every day to just have to, that's not doing it spiritually. Like you could try to lie to yourself and say that. And I think that's what I was doing. Cause I was like, oh yeah, I'm like taking these pills and like getting access to like other levels of reality or, <laughs> you know, but, um, I also have done so much acid that I don't even really need to do acid anymore because of how much acid that I did where I can just like if I stare long enough at something I will probably start hallucinating and scrying like a wall um and I wow. learned a lot then and, and I don't think that um that is necessary because you can access all of these things they were talking about me being an oracle um you can access your psychic abilities without drugs and alcohol. You don't actually need that. And the things that I have done and my abilities now are so much better. And so I think that's another big aspect of it too, is like for people to not lie to themselves about what's going on. And a big aspect of being strong spiritually is, is taking care of your physical body as hard as that is. And as much as we keep trying to like fight existing in the physical world and just trying to exist in like some sort of ephemeral uh, astral existence, especially with like the internet where it's like you barely even exist in the real world anymore. Um, that's a big aspect of it too. So yeah, it's been a long and very hard journey for me. There have been so many times where I am blessed to be alive um, from experiences and bad situations that I was in from all of that. And um, I think that it's something that affects so many people. And I, and I hope that by listening to this, if you are somebody that is struggling with those kind of things that, you know, like you're not alone, this happens to so many people and you will feel better if you get off of that stuff. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I get a lot of comments uh, on these videos, especially people that have gone through addiction. So thank you again for sharing that. I'm happy to share it with people because it's important for everyone to realize that this is a big aspect of the, the tragedy of black magic, where we get access to all this power or you, let's say you get a whole bunch of money, right? And then you you get lured away. And that's the illusions of reality, the same ones that are trying to control people and make you enslaved. It's like that same energy because if you look at it from a distance, like sure, a, sure. I did some really cool art when I was high. So I can also do really cool art now and not feel like shit. And like, that's a big aspect of it too. Um, and, and live longer to do more things. I think that's a big aspect of it as well. But um, it's, it's really easy for people to get swept away because of the power that comes with magic and how it's very easy for people to get like strung along by delusions and not looking at things in the bigger picture. And um, I feel really grateful and, and honestly, like very um, humbled to share this with everybody today because it has been a very long time for me, like uh, of going through those things and being able to come out of it and uh, to share that with people. So hopefully it'll like 
maybe give somebody out there some hope. I'm sure it will. Thank you again. You're welcome. I I really like your YouTube channel. You've got some really great videos over there. Uh, my favorite is your New Orleans uh, Halloween French Quarter live stream. That actually made me homesick <laughs> going around New Orleans. But you've got some really great di uh, videos about summoning demons. Do you have a favorite that uh, that you work with as far as um, you know, you talked about Lilith and, and different ones, but is there one that is more like your guardian or, or uh, I mean, some people describe them as that. I would say Satan for sure, because I have gone to the depths of everything I could possibly do to give myself to Satan, where I feel like at this point, it's like, I'm like property of Satan. So, so if people are trying to like do something, it's like, well, there's, you're Satan. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're an Oracle you had mentioned. So how long have you been? And can you tell us a little bit about how you first really knew that you had that? I know you experienced supernatural uh, things in your past that you mentioned, but how did you really know that that was a gift that you had? It started with dreams. So about maybe 15 years ago, I started to have a lot of dreams about things that had been going on behind my back in relationships I was in. And then also having dreams about children who had passed away and I had been able to actually verify that those were real and that they had lived in the locations that were revealed to me in a dream. And so that really freaked me out. And so, um, cause that's a lot, that's like a heavy burden to bear, uh, to have people reaching out to you for help in your dreams. And so I started going along with them in the dreams and helping them and uh, to, to find peace. And so that's when it first really started. And the cards just, you know what it was? That was actually the very first, the very first thing that I ever bought that was magic, magic thing, aside from the books, was my uh, Alistair Crowley Thoth deck, the, the one that I still have here uh, and I use for all my clients. I, I've had that since I was 18. And uh, I started, I started because I was dating a guy that was in jail. <laughs> And he told me that I needed to, I needed to, <laughs> I needed to get the Oracle deck to learn magic, <laughs> that, uh, the, the card deck to, to learn uh, the cards so I could develop my psychic abilities uh, and, and talk to him while he was in jail uh, telepathically, a true story. Uh, and so, and so, <laughs> and so that, that's, that's back when I was a teenager, of course. And so that's, that's when that's when that started. And I started like develop, trying to develop that. Um, and it was kind of like a novelty at first. Like I never was trying to do it seriously as a profession. Like I would have never thought of that. And I also um, grew up in Thelema where people like really turn their noses up on um, doing rituals and getting paid for it or getting paid for tarot readings and stuff. Like which is actually in their own doctrine, not what that actually means or says. And I'm just going to leave that there, put a pin in it and move on. Um, so it's, I'm fine. And so, so anyway, um, with this, I got hired one time by one of my bosses to do readings for people at the office I worked at. I, I used to work for this nonprofit call center because like I look really weird so I but I could do like work over the phone so I, we work for all these different charities and and my boss hired me to do readings for everyone at work like as a fun because he thought it was fun um and then it ended up being like this whole serious thing where I had like ladies crying and it was like really uh way more emotionally intense than I think anyone thought it was going to be and that was also when I realized like wow there's some serious power to these cards and like learning about the map of the universe. And so then I started studying the cards even further. And um, a year ago is when 
the uh, grandmaster of the esoteric order Dagon contacted me and he sent me the oracle deck that I have been using um, for those oracles, which are like cryptic Lovecraftian messages that are from like beyond the void. So not anything that is uh, cohesive to a, like a person's specific daily needs, but it's like quite profound. And, and he, he had found me just through all these strange synchronicities of the internet and uh, sent me the deck. And so that's how I started uh, doing that. And it's one of those things where I'm constantly blown away at how easy or it becomes the more and more people practice. So I think that anyone can become like an oracle or a psychic if you really want to. You just literally have to practice. Like with any art, it's about knowing how to move your brain around, how to open yourself up to getting messages and hearing things or feeling things that are subtle that um, people don't normally pay attention to, but it's all there. So I was listening to an episode of Knights of Nephilim, and uh, it, it's one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, Freighter Crow uh, does a really great job with that. He was interviewing you, and you had mentioned that people across the globe experience similar occurrences in magic and demonic evocation. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I believe they came from some books that you were reading, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a series of books that, if you can look through history, have been had material from one composed into others and, and, and handed across like from one culture to another, leading to what we have today as the, the Ars Goetia, the lesser key of Solomon. And so that book is something that was the first grimoire that I was taught to use to summon demons. But the person who taught me was a black magician. And I say was because he has passed away. He passed away very, very young from doing very reckless demonic magic and being addicted to alcohol. So I just also want to say that one of my te even my own teachers um, passed away from those things. And so anyway, uh, I learned from his mistakes. He, he, he was a black magician. And so when he took the Ars Goetia, he would approach it in a way where like, we weren't going to act like these demons were evil. We were going to give them a chance. And we were going to use the science of like geometries and the vibration of sounds to call them, but not in a way that's like acting disrespectful in any way to the spirit, but being as loving and respectful uh, as we can to these spirits, like loving them. And so that was controversial compared to how that system was typically taught. But I think it gave me access where there at the time there really wasn't stuff for for people like like this like the, the, it, it was so long ago it's so amazing like how much things have changed in in like this period of time just thinking about it and having this conversation totally blows my mind um because this was like 10 years ago like not that long ago um so anyway I didn't have other people to talk to so like for example I have a lot of clients that will ask me like what is it like to summon Lucifer or what is it like to summon this demon or how do you summon this demon or, or something like that and there was nobody to ask back when I started doing these things so I just started meeting the spirits having experiences with them getting to know their personalities and what I would see when I would scry them and then sharing that with whoever I could that was also interested in summoning these demons. And we even had like a little, a little group of people that uh, we kind of under the radar of the authorities of the orders that they were in were like secretly like summoning demons together. So they could, I was like teaching them like how to do it. Um, because in a lot of magical orders, stuff like the Ars Goetia is like the highest level of magic to learn, which is understandable because like you really do need to actually know what you're doing to not do something stupid. Um, but, and it's not supposed to be for beginners, but that's, so it's okay to learn from it and like start learning things and then get to it when you're ready. 
but um, I noticed that the experience, what made me realize that the stuff was real. Um, and this is before I was having like crazily profound success in the specific spells I was doing, but the personalities of these spirits would be the same. Like when I would conjure them and, and, and have these things, my friend like that I would talk to, they would have the same experiences, like the same kind of personality of how the demon would talk. Some of them would just talk in rhymes. Like it was so bizarre and the things they would see and the experiences they would have were the same. And so that made me realize like, okay, I, I don't think I'm crazy here. I'm not just making this stuff up there's something real to this. And that really provoked me to go even further into it. Um, because I didn't believe in any of this kind of witchcraft stuff, like growing up, I, it all seemed just like more religion to me, more, more just believing in stuff that people are telling you is real, but it's just like, is it real or not? And, uh, so you don't have to believe in things that you don't actually experience, but that's not the same as like not having an open mind to it. So um, it was so interesting to see how multiple people are having these same experiences with these demons. And uh, through this, we were even uncovering things like in the books, because of course there's so many demons, um, the information about them would just get copied from one book to another, maybe even mistranslated. And so the people who actually were meeting the demon were figuring out like what it actually said and meant. So it was cool. So Orly, what advice do you have for someone that is searching? They're, they're looking at the left-hand path. They're trying to find their way just, just like we all have. What advice would you have for them? Know that you don't have to learn everything right away. And to start with the things that you find the most enjoyable learning about, there's going to be a lot of places that you'll find where they act like that place or that group or that book has all the answers and it's only that one place that is 100% wrong there is no one answer or one place to find things everything is inside of you and the path of your spiritual journey doesn't have a goal to enjoy the actual path of learning things and to not let fear control you when you are seeking and learning things as well, because what's most important is learning and going forward based on the things that you've actually experienced yourself, not out of a fear of something that you have just been told by other people. That's great advice. Thank you. Is there anything that you would like to share with our viewers and listeners that we haven't discussed tonight? Well, I just recently put out a very special book that's called Mother of Abominations, Witchcraft Dreamscapes. If you search my name on Amazon, you'll find it. It is a book that contains my art from over the past 15 years. And with every single piece, I've included a spell that you can read to give you spiritual access to the artwork so you can essentially explore and scry each and every one of the the spirit portals in the book and um, it's been a tremendous endeavor so I'm very uh, excited that it's out now and so people have had some pretty interesting experiences with it and I, I always love hearing about it too if you're someone that's already tried it too. Well, I'm going to get a copy of that, and I'm going to put all of the links in the description. I'll also link the book directly in those Thanks. links. Uh, I'm excited about that. I, I guess I missed that doing the research, but I'm going to get a copy of it. So I'm a busy bee. There's, well, there's yeah. a lot of stuff going down. <laughs> You are. You're very talented and a lot of different things going on. And I think that really makes our left-hand path community interesting. It really does. Orly, thank you so much for spending time with me tonight. Um, I, I think people are really going to get a blessing from, uh, from your testimony about addiction. And then I think they'll be really inspired with all the things that you've done. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much.
And for those listening and watching, this has been Alistair Knocked. Hail Satan. <laughs>